the recording. Yes, the recording has started. And I will give a proper introduction and we'll start, okay? Sure. Okay, hello people. Uh, hello dear uh, Achik Bain followers. We are now again for the second time with uh, uh, Stuart Kaufman. Uh, you know him uh, already from our uh, previous broadcast about his theories and interesting ideas. And you asked for more and now uh, I'm very glad that he's accepted. He's with us right now. Uh, and we are uh, making another episode of Achik Bain Lectures to introduce uh, Stuart's uh, thoughts in a more detail, hopefully. And he's also, uh, he said to me, he's very happy to make this conversation and I would like to thank him to join us again. Welcome, Stu, how are you? Thank you so much, Janan. Okay, thank you uh, very much again for participating. Uh, I want to start off by uh, confessing something, uh, what I realized in my life, this science of complexity, uh, I think transforms people in very unpredictable ways because I'm just one of them. When I started to learn this, I uh, gradually became a different person than I was. Um, and uh, Stuart Kaufman, our guest right now, is one of the leading thinkers in my personal maturation. And thanks for this again to you. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about this book. It's published 12 years ago, and its title is Reinventing the Sacred by Stuart Kaufman. Unfortunately, it's not translated into Turkish yet. Uh, this is my call for publishers in Turkey. This, this is a very important book, and you should act quickly and translate this into our language. And um, I love this book because as long as I can remember, I've been searching for an alternative approach to both uh, this religious supernaturalism, which is for me quite unfounded, and the well-known, uh, quite cold scientific secularism. We have, we have two options, spiritualism or this secularism. So I always uh, sought for a different explanation or a combined view. So you present us a unified view of the cosmos through complexity science in a nutshell. Uh, for me, you seem to try to bind cause and effect or uh, reason and the consequence into a cohesive picture for every one of us. Why did you feel a need for it? Why com what compels you to think that this worldview is worth telling and worth understanding? Why should we even bother <laughs> Uh, you know, make ourselves restless about this. Well, Sinan, thank you. Um, like all of us, uh, my own thinking about these matters has evolved, I hope matured. Let me, let me, if I may start with the following. We always see ourselves in the world in some way, and then we are in the world that we think is the real world, but our view of the world keeps changing. Uh, so let me take us back 10,000 years, the late ice age. Uh, people were in Finland as the ice was melting. And there's a, a, a lovely oral tradition called Kalevala. And I actually have some of it. In it, there's the story of Kulervo, sired by Kalervo and Kulervo uh, with the bare knife of Kalervo, uh, waters the trees, rides the wild wood, the wild waters, uh, cuts the trees and leaves one tree left. Its berries become all that is. So this, this is this exquisite image from 10,000 years ago of the potentiality of life. The berries become everything. And he was, and they were 10,000 years ago, deeply embedded in, in nature, and of course they were. Well, over the years, we come to be in the world in a different way. So for the, for the early Greeks, there was, uh, there was the god Eros, who was the god of creative chaos, and there's Logos, law. And the world at that time is a mixture of chaotic creativity beyond any law, and then Logos law, which then becomes early Greek science, in which Thales, uh, the Ionian, says, 
you know, it's not the gods, it's, it's water, everything's water. And then water became earth, air, fire, and water, and that becomes atoms in the void. Well, atoms in the void then are the same thing as quarks and gluons now. And so that becomes scientia, science, but you can pray to the gods and argue with them. I mean, in, 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 uh, in the Old Testament, as you know, in Islam as well, Moses argues with God. Uh, you can't argue uh, with earth, air, fire, and water. It just is. So come forward centuries to, to Copernicus, and just before Copernicus uh, in the West, and the Western view, and I, I guess in Turkey too, I don't know, was the concentric spheres, uh, the moon on a sphere, out beyond that was the sun on a sphere, beyond that were the, the fixed stars on spheres, and beyond that were, was, were angels, and then way far away was God, the creator of everything, and below the spheres here on earth as humans, uh, and then, then there's animals, and then little wiggly things, and then down towards the center of the earth are the concentric spheres of hell in Dante's Divine, Divine Comedy. So for a thousand years, that's cosmology in the Western world. You'll have to tell me if it's true in Turkey too, but I suppose so. Actually, Compern not quite. In, in the Middle East, there was a different uh, approach, but it's uh, quite, uh, you know, um, uh, it's not very eminent, you can, it's not very prominent. We cannot see it when you look to the history books, but uh, probably you heard the House of Wisdom, uh, the, uh, it's around 800 and 1200. So no, I don't know that, what's the House uh, of Wisdom? It's, it's, a, it's another issue, maybe uh, we can talk it later, uh, because it's, it's a very interesting era. So, so let's just take this Western view. And Copernicus comes along and whenever it was in, in uh, uh, 1680 or wh whatever it was. And he says, you know, maybe the earth is going around the sun. And uh, people are interested in it. And then Galileo comes along and he has the bad grace to look through a telescope. And he sees moons rotating around uh, Jupiter and says, look, if the moons can rotate around Jupiter, why can't we rotate around the sun? So we move to the heliocentric view. Well, what happened to the Western mind? We lost cosmic meaning. We were the center of the cosmos for a thousand years. Then this guy Copernicus comes along, and now we are flung and we're rotating around some silly star, which it turns out is on the edge of some random galaxy among 10 to the 11th galaxies, each with 10 to the 11th stars. And that move, at least in the West, stripped us of cosmic meaning. Then we get to magnificent Newton, who was superb. Uh, and he, 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 he didn't know, any, this is really interesting, at, at 20, he didn't know any mathematics. So he actually went into a store to buy a book on astrology because people were interested in astrology and it had a picture of a triangle and he didn't understand that. So he bought a book on trigonometry and he didn't understand that. So he bought Euclid on geometry and he understood that. And three years later at age 23, he invented differential and integral calculus and classical physics, three laws of motion and universal gravitation. He's a very smart person. So the magnificent consequences are classical physics, the Newtonian paradigm, which I'll get to in a moment, but Newton gives us a mechanical universe. He's coming out of an era in which people are making clocks, and the whole universe is a big clockwork. It's the clockwork universe, which of course is meaningless, except that, uh, except that of course, God has created it, and, and so we move from theism in the West to deism by the 18th century, in which God can't perform any more miracles. Uh, and you look for God in the gaps between what we can explain with science and not, and the battle between religion and science goes on. And here we are with superb physicist uh, Steven Weinberg 20 years ago in Dreams of a Final Theory saying, the more we know of the universe, the more meaningless it seems. We're stripped of meaning. Yes, actually, We're wrong. You, you, you mentioned him. I probably uh, marked that page. I don't know if I can find it. Uh, 
uh, where was that? Okay, missed it. You, you say, uh, where, we, where we're going to put this, you know, pr productions and, you know, thinkers and opera. So what are these, if these yeah, are, we're, these, aren't they all the furniture of the, uh, the fabric of the universe, actually? So yeah, our, our poetry and thinkers and singers and, and uh, cantatas, and, and they are. So, he, so Newton was exquisite, Copernicus was exquisite, Einstein is, is the culmination of classical physics, quantum mechanics is amazing and superb, general relativity is confirmed to 13 decimal places, so is quantum mechanics. We don't know how they tie together, of course, but people are struggling with it. But that universe feels amazing but meaningless, and it's also totally law-governed or law-described. So let's talk about what that means, because that's lying behind the, the book, Reinventing the Sacred. Uh, so so let, me, let, me, let me say what I will call, following my friend Lee Smolin, the Newtonian paradigm. Mm -hmm. So we know it from the billiard table. So here's the billiard table with the billiard balls rolling around. And we say, uh, 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 Newton, what, 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 what's going to happen? And he said, look, I've got these three laws of motion. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you're supposed to do is look at the boundary conditions of the table. The boundary conditions, this is something very interesting, Shinan. Given the boundary conditions, and if you know what the relevant variables are, and in physics, in this case, it's position and momentum, where momentum is the velocity of a ball in a particular direction multiplied by its mass, having to find the edges of the table you know all possible positions and momenta of the balls on the table before you ever roll a ball. So the set of all possible positions is what's called the phase space of the system, and it's defined by the boundary conditions. They specify all possible positions and momenta of the balls if they're on the table. And then says Newton, look, please tell me where the balls are right now. So you specify the initial conditions, where the balls are, what direction they're moving in and how fast. And then you say, okay, Newton, what am I supposed to do? And he said, look, I wrote down my equations of motion in differential form. Use my equations of motion and integrate my equations of motion. That is to derive the consequences of the differential equations for the trajectories of the balls in the phase space of the system. Mm -hmm. So Newtonian paradigm is always take the universe, take a, a part of the universe, which Lee Smolin stresses, so it's always a subset of the universe, define the relevant variables, write down the laws of motion for the system, uh, find the initial state of the system, integrate the equations, you'll get the flow of the system in a state space, and in classical mechanics, the machine. But by looking from this point in time, uh, mm -hmm. backwards, actually, we can say now it's actually a very very simplified model that our brain can easily grasp and understand so probably this is why we love that so much right we understand yeah. it very clearly mathematically it's a low driven theory so too good to be true actually <laughs> and it's you know that with maxwell's equation uh before we get to quantum mechanics gives you the physics of uh say 1870 Mm -hmm. yeah, it's magnificent. Then, you know, quantum mechanics comes along. And this is, this is the first major crisis in physics post-Newton, where it's discovered that there's a quantum of action by Planck, and that therefore, you have to accept indeterminacy. Mm -hmm. uh, Einstein, of course, never accepted it. And what you get then is the famous Schrodinger equation, the Schrodinger equation is a linear wave equation. It propagates something deterministically, but it's not the positions of things. It propagates a probability distribution uh, deterministically in time and space. And the probability distribution is the probability some, that some quantum event will come to be upon this magical process called quantum measurement, such as uh, an electron will be spin up, will be measured and become, come to be, spin up at this location in space at this time. 
and quantum mechanics works, but it forced us to give up determinism. So I'm moving forward cautiously. That whole view is called reductionism. It was introduced by Laplace at about the time of Napoleon. And Laplace said, you know, if I knew the positions and the moment of all the particles in the universe, I could use Newton's laws and I could deduce the entire future and past of the universe. So that's the birth of modern reductionism. It is the dream that there's a theory down there that, that logically entails everything that will become. To integrate Newton's equation is to deduce logically what will happen. So this is the view of the universe as a machine. And even with quantum mechanics, it's, a, it's, a, it's still a machine in the sense that everything that can happen is entailed right from the beginning. Yeah. So piece of history, call that strong reductionism. I argued with Murray Galman about it. It's the only time I've ever beaten Murray in an argument. Uh, he's died now, so I can have more arguments with him and he can't respond. He would beat me anyway. Anyway, at around seven, 1972, Nobel laureate Phil Anderson wrote a, a critical paper called More is Different. And Phil's point, and later another Nobel laureate, uh, Robert uh, Lachlan, wrote a book called The Universe from the Bottom Down. And they're both saying something that begins to question reductionism for the first time. So they both say at higher levels, law behaviors can emerge that call for laws at their own level that cannot be reduced to or explained from the laws at the lower level. So one example is fluid motion. If you go out and look at a river, that's described by incompressible fluid flow called the Navier-Stokes equation, and it works beautifully. You, cannot de you can't deduce it from quantum mechanics, and you can deduce it from things that aren't quantum mechanics, like cellular automata. You so have to have different levels of experience. Yeah, so the yeah, they're, so they're there's not directly connected or. Uh, you cannot deduce the higher level from the lower level. And so Anderson wanted to say, and didn't want to say, this is emergence. Phenomena emerge at a higher level, they're lawful, but you can't derive from. So reductionism in the strong sense fails. And Lachlan's saying the same thing. And there, there's solid state physicists, Nobel laureates, and they're very good. So I'm going to tell you something that is even more dramatic that I was getting to in Reinventing the Sacred, which came out in 2008. And it's now solid. And I will tell you why. I'm going to tell you that the evolving biosphere, it evolves perfectly well. It is not that there are new laws that emerge at a higher level that entails the development of a bio, of, of an biosphere. It's much more radical than that, Simon. There are no laws at all. None. I'll, I'll, I'll show you this, but it's transformative to realize it. And I think that, it changed. That's a big claim, actually. We should, we should get a yeah. break on this because it's a big yeah, it it, This is an absolutely huge and transformative claim. And I think that I can show you that it's correct. I've become it's become ever clearer to me. It's taking an awful long time, uh, 25 years. If this is right, the world is different than we thought. It's not, quotes, law governed or law entailed. There is a raw, spectacular creativity in the becoming of biospheres. Mm -hmm. I was getting to the first hints of that when I wrote Reinventing the Sacred. There's a chapter in there called Beyond the Galilean Spell, where I begin to see it and it's now clear to me. So that's where we're going. So if the becoming of a biosphere is entailed by no law, except for the moment, look out the window. The biosphere is an enormously complex system. It's the most complex thing we know in the universe. I mean, there are 10 to the 11th galaxies, each with 10 to the 11th stars, and we, we really don't know what's going on on them very much. But a biosphere is stunning. If there are no laws that entail its becoming, then even though the biosphere is clearly based on physics, it's beyond physics, it's the most complex thing we know. Therefore, you do not need entailing laws for something of extraordinary, magnificent complexity to arise, namely a biosphere. Yeah. So that, that's already, that's huge. 
and it's transformative of how we see ourselves in the world and how we are in the world. So I'm going somewhere with this. It is that as we begin to understand how can, and can why. You, can, you, can you tilt your monitor a little bit downwards, please? Oh yeah, that, that's better. So I want to try to get to this because just as 10,000 years ago, we saw ourselves in the world in some way, and as the early Greeks saw themselves in a world of chaos, chaos and creativity, and after Newton, we saw ourselves in a mechanical universe that was meaningless, I truly think that we have a new view of reality that's emerging. The bias here is absolutely filled with meaning. Our conversation is meaningful to us. Yes. I will give the example of a mixed microbial community. And my, my example that I'm now in love with is one of the bacteria has a firm surface. And the other bacteria is glad because the other bacterium can use the firm surface to crawl on to get some food. Mm -hmm. And maybe the bacterium dribbles some glucose on the first bacterium. The biosphere is full of organisms trading features that allow us all to coexist with one another, like firm surfaces and for a woodpecker, a tree that it can make a nest in, that allow us to get to exist. We get to exist. We get to exist by virtue of everybody else as well as us. With a complex all, interaction with all of them. Yeah, our, our, my existence is enabled by everybody else's existence and vice versa. The same thing is true in the evolving economy that we're all very familiar with. You, uh, the existence of automobiles invites the existence of a gas industry to support the automobiles. Yeah, and, and the existence of automobiles in a gas industry uh, means you need paved roads. So you start getting paving roads. Then cars are driving fast, so you need traffic lights and traffic courts. And then if you're driving, you need motels and fast food restaurants, and then you get suburbia. We are the conditions of our existing and of what comes next to exist in the entire becoming of a biosphere from 3.7 billion years ago to now, to the existence of uh, an emergence of humanity and the human lineage, to the evolution of our economy. It is a, it's an ongoing co-creation. Co mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so now I want to get to why there can't be a law. Um, I'm going to need you, do you know the word engine block, Shinan? Engine block? Yeah, when you make a car, if you look at an en uh, an engine in your automobile, mm -hmm. it's made out of a big block of steel. Yeah, right. It, engine blocks. Yeah. Do you know a word for it in in, in Turkish? Motor blue. Yeah, it's the same thing. Engine block. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a story that launches us into all of this. I learned it years ago. I hope that it's true. So I'm going to say that it's true because it's a cute story. Mm -hmm. So this is in. I'm in, in New Mexico, I live there, and we can tell jokes about Texas. So I'm going to put this in 1921 in Texas, and some Texas engineers are going to invent the tractor. They know they need a huge engine block, so they get a huge engine block, a very, very big, heavy engine block, and they know they're going to have to put it on a chassis so it can move. So they get a chassis, and they put the engine block on the chassis, and the engine block is so big it breaks the chassis. Mm -hmm. So they get a bigger chassis, and it breaks the second chassis. And they get a bigger chassis, and it breaks the third chassis. And one of the engineers looks at it, and he says, you know, the engine block is so big, and it is so rigid, we can use the engine block itself as the chassis. And that's, in fact, how tractors are made, and formula racing cars. Something magic happened. So let's pause and look at it. The engineer looked at this big engine block and he saw in it a causal property that was of no use for the purposes of making an engine by drilling holes, but it could be put to use for a new purpose. You could use the rigidity of the engine block to make a chassis. So one of the questions is how did the engineer see that property? But hold that. Now, in evolution, the same thing happens. They're called Darwinian pre-adaptations. 
And molecules and cells are physical objects and they have causal properties and they come to be used for different purposes. Yep. So the same protein can be used as a structure or to catalyze a reaction or to bind something. So any, any physical thing has a variety of causal features. So I'm now going to, I finally got the example. It took me all those times, you know. So let's ask possible uses of an engine block. Well, it can be used to drill holes in and make an engine. Uh, it certainly can be used as a chassis. Uh, it's a superb paper weight. You know, if you put a little piece of paper under it, and it weighs you know, 10,000 pounds, paper's not going to move. I've gotten absolutely uh, enthralled in love with the idea that the corners of an engine block are sharp, and they're superb for breaking open coconuts, right? Yes, of course. I, I love I mean, I love this example, so I'm going to come back. You can also polish one side, it will be a mirror. You can make this thing concave where you polish it out and make it parabolic, parabolic and it could reflect sunlight and you can start a fire. Now, let's go back to using the engine block to crack open coconuts because it's the funniest. In evolution, it can really happen that something that was used as a chassis could come to be used to crack open coconuts. Of course, it's not that. And here's the central question on, could you possibly deduce from the use of the engine block as a chassis that it could come to be used or would come to be used to crack open coconuts? And the answer is, of course not. There's simply no deductive relationship. Agreed? This, you this, can't is, deduce why, this is why I laughed at that, because it's funny, because it's yeah. unreal. <laughs> yeah. So, so here it is. It's really true that in evolution and in technological evolution, but in biological evolution, things next come to exist and there's no deductive relationship between them. Just say it again, how would you deduce from the engine block being used as a chassis that it would come to be used to crack open coconuts? There's no deductive relationship. But if there's no deductive relationship, there could be no entailing laws by which it's deduced. But that means that the becoming of the biosphere is beyond any entailing law. And that's it. That's the simplest way of saying it. I've been saying it with, uh, with the Giuseppe Longo and Mael Monteville now for several years. And so the more formal way of saying it is the following. In physics, you can always pre-state the face space, like the billiard balls on the table in the table. In biological evolution, uh, part of the face space in biological evolution are the functions of things. Uh, so, for example, uh, your heart pumps blood, and pumping blood is the function of the heart, and that's why you're alive, because it pumps blood. What's happening in evolution is the coming into existence of ever new functions, like the use of the engine block to crack open, open coconuts. Those are the relevant variables, but you can't say them ahead of time. You could not have said ahead of time, oh, here's this creature and it's using an engine block to crack open coconuts, except that it's on a smaller scale. That means, we realized, the phase space of evolution is changing. It's changing all the time. We cannot say ahead of time what the ever-changing phase space is from, from chassis to cracking open coconuts. Therefore, since we don't know what the phase space is, we cannot write down laws of motion in differential form because we don't know what the relevant variables are. So since we don't have laws of motion, we can't integrate them. Therefore, the evolution of the biosphere is not entailed by anything. I think this is right. And it is huge, Shinan, because it says that the most complex system we know, what's out your window, is entailed by no law. Now, let's go beyond that. I mean, this, this is really huge. It means that 330 years after Wonderful Newton and the claim that everything is a machine uh, and that we live in a mechanical universe, it's false. There's no final theory down there, even though the physicists are still looking for it. I'm talking to some physicists now, and we're trying to write some papers to say, gee, there's something interesting here to look at. That means we are not in the world that we've been in in the West and now around the first world that we've been in since Newton. The world's different. We can be in it a different way. So now let's get to me. Actually, 
actually you are reminding us the obvious because if you think a little bit everybody can see this but my problem we cannot see this clearly uh, enough even the scientists working in such fields because the notion or the term law is actually a, a human construct because in nature we don't see any wild animals or plants have some kind of laws in their you know society right. or population right. when we when we come to this you know uh, uh, when we just evolved from uh, you know hunter gatherer populations into uh, societies inside cities we needed law so we just make up the notion of law actually we invented it we just right. came up with that idea so when when we look back as far as i understand from you when we look back for uh, backwards in time we see something and we ascribe some kind of laws or rules to them but we cannot foresee what's going to happen and we say that is chaotic we don't know it so it's actually an illusion when you're looking back and regarding everything as an engineering product like like a machine like a computer it's not like that you say uh, am i understanding this correctly it's it's only almost. working backwards almost so let's come forward from 10,000 years ago we were in a world of agents yes it's it's a uh, kulervo kalervo the lone woman wandering alone uh, and we are in our worlds with uh, our gods and everything is situated so for homer for example uh I'll, let me tell you, Homer, then come back to what you're saying. So I've been thinking about all of this. So Homer is writing in, in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Why it is that Odysseus's ship is sunk in the middle of the ocean going back to wherever they're going back to. So this is a wonderful uh, piece, uh, Shinon. So, so, so basically, Homer fashions a story for why it is that Odysseus's ship got sunk. Well, it turns out that Odysseus's men had stolen the sacred cows of the sun god. Well, the sun god got really angry. And he talked to Zeus and he said, you punish these mortals. Otherwise, I will go down and give my light to the dead people in Hades. And Zeus agrees with him that this is intolerable. So Zeus, who gathers clouds, hides in a cloud and he throws a huge thunderbolt at, at uh, Odysseus's ship and the mass comes crashing down, it crashes on the head of the helmsman whose head breaks open and the, the boat swirls in our circle and all the men fall into the sea and they're lost and the gods preclude the homecoming the men so richly deserved. Well, it's a wonderful story. And so what's going on? Well, there's ships and there's the grain giving earth and there's the sun god and you better not irritate the gods because they can really do stuff to you and you understand completely what's going on. Um, if Odysseus and his men were so stupid as to steal the cows of the sun god, what could they expect? It was wonderful. And it's all agent tival in its explanation because we're agent tival people. You know, we do things for reasons and motives and we understand it. So, you know, then, then comes along Thales and earth, air, fire, and water. And earth, air, and fire, and water really don't care about us. And neither do quarks and gluons. And so the universe is meaningless except that it entirely leaves life out. There's no life in that story. So once life originates, um, let me tell you what a Kantian whole is. I'm going to say that once li life uh, initiates, we get from matter to mattering. And matter to mattering is the onset of values in the universe, and it's real. Our conversation matters to us right now, it really does. And presumably it matters to the, the, the viewers of this program. So where'd that come from? Well, let me define a Kantian whole. Kant said, an organized being has the property that the parts exist for and by means of the whole. So you're a Kantian whole. You exist for and by means of your heart and your liver and your kidney and your spleen. But they exist because of you. You have kids and they have hearts and so on. So because you are a Kantian whole, you propagate you and your parts to the future. Mm -hmm. So that's a Kantian whole. Well, is, life is, is, 
we talk, talk this in a greater detail in our previous chapter if you uh yeah friends if you Hold want that, I can back. more so, you can just uh watch yeah, so 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 once kantian holds emerged the origin of life which i'll get to again in a moment um there's the notion of good for me or bad for me namely it's now as my wife kate says of enormous selective advantage to me to sense my world evaluate it good or bad for me and act based on that so that evolved very early now once there's good or bad for me meaning has entered the universe and i'm an amoeba and it is good or bad for me i'm a me and it's good or bad for me i'm an ant and it's good or bad for me i'm a tree and it's good and bad for me and it really is so for every organism who makes its living with the other organisms around it we are all the conditions of one of this existence because your flat surface affords me a way to crawl and get some food or our global economy affords us ways to make a living that's rich with meaning therefore the notion that the universe is without meaning is just wrong the biosphere is full of meaning and we are part of it and it's becoming is entailed by no law how much magic do you want it's the magic of the creativity of the biosphere and that's the sense of reinventing the sacred genome so come forward on a couple more things um we're it's becoming clearer that the emergence of life in the universe may be very very likely so let me let's just label this is life plausible in the universe so the universe starts as a quark glue on soup 13.7 billion years ago then the universe cools and the quarks and the gluons can find and you get protons and electrons then the universe and electrons and, and, and neutrons universe cools a bit more and you start getting atoms you get hydrogen and helium and lithium then stars form because of gravitational clustering from initial instabilities then you get stars and you get the gradual construction of all possible 98 atoms so the possibilities of the universe are are getting greater okay the the phase space of the universe is increasing i'm just doing this work with lee smolan and martina cortez and andrew little so the idea is that the space of possibilities of the universe is getting greater and greater and greater there's a new idea uh, and this is all four of us we're just finally putting the paper up um so this means now something that is, is strange let me try to define it and this is work with my colleagues to find the notion of ergodic so let's take the liter box of gas um and basically the idea is that the gas comes to equilibrium mm -hmm. uh, and an image for it is if you take a coffee cup and you put a little droplet of cream in it uh, uh it'll swirl and eventually it'll be a uniform color that's that's equilibrium the macroscopic property here the color no longer changes for the molecules in the box temperature and pressure stop changing those are the macroscopic variables and there's all of statistical mechanics which i'm not going to go into so what we mean by not equilibrium is not having gotten to equilibrium and during the period when it is not at equilibrium let's use the phrase not ergodic so when you put a little droplet in the coffee cup and it's swirling and you can still see the swirls it's not ergodic and a macroscopic process is happening it's still distributing itself well it turns out and this again is the work with my colleagues at lee has cut we've come up it's lee's idea of the notion of the universe having not our goodicity on on three classes of time scales a century the life of the universe and far beyond the life of the universe so your coffee cup comes to equilibrium in the lifetime of a century lots of things do there are other things lee and my colleagues tell me that come to equilibrium sort of on the lifetime of the universe like stellar lives I realized some years ago, and I'm going to tell it to you, and then Lee and the others are helping me fashion this, that the universe is non-ergodic on vastly longer time scales than the universe. And so here's the way of seeing it. Um, everybody, I think, knows what a protein is, but here it is. There's 20 kinds of amino acids. So a protein is 
20 kinds of amino acids strung together end to end. A typical protein in you has 300 amino acids. I could say the Shinan because I've said it many times. So let's just take proteins length 200. How many are possible? Well, there's 20 choices at each position. So it's 20 times 20 times 20, 200 times. That's 10 to the 260th. So I got to thinking a few years ago, could the universe have made them all? Well, no. So let's just look at it. The fastest time scale is the Planck time scale of 10 to the minus 43rd seconds. There's 10 to the 80th particles. So if the particles were doing nothing uh, in, every, in parallel, in every 10 to the minus 43rd seconds making proteins length 200, you can ask, how long would it take to make all of the possible proteins? And it turns out to be our age of the universe times 10 raised to the 37th power. That's what we mean by, yeah, so that's what we're going to mean by class three non-ergodic. It's Lee's name. But class three non-ergodic means something fundamental. It means most complex things will never exist. Yeah. Right? That's the main but, issue, actually. Yeah, it is the main issue. And yet, and I finally realized this and got it down in my last book, uh, A World Beyond Physics, we have hearts. Well, hearts are really complex things. Oh, Why? What? Why are there hearts? Well, we know why there's hearts. Life started, and once you, so let me give us uh, an autocatalytic. So did I talk about this last time? Yeah, we talked about that. Okay, well, let's go and, back. And, and our, uh, you know, listeners were very much confused about that. <laughs> okay. We were just telling, uh, no illustrations, but you uh, t told us very clearly, but the concept is rather complex. So let's just sort of say again what a, uh, an autocatalytic set is. So catalysis speeds up a chemical reaction in its approach to equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So to give our example again, or whatever I said, Shinan, let's suppose that I can, let us suppose that you and I are two complicated molecules, and I can catalyze the formation of a second copy of you by taking two pieces of you and gluing them together. Mm -hmm. And you can catalyze a second copy of me by taking two pieces of me and gluing them together. So I help you get formed, and you help me get formed. And from the outside, people are putting in Xenon parts and Stu parts. Mm -hmm. So that is a collectively autocatalytic set. And that, that's it, that's the idea. Yeah. Well, we, we are a Kantian whole. We both get to exist because I, I catalyze your formation and you catalyze my formation. Neither of us can do it alone. There's a holism, okay? Um, so I get to exist because I'm part of you and me, and you get to exist because you're part of you and me. And we, as a set, get to exist because I and you are parts. Mm -hmm. So we are a Kantian whole. And so are you as an organism. So all living things are Kantian wholes leaving out viruses right now. So let's get life started. It, it may well have been an autocatalytic set of very small molecules. Joanna Xavier has found an autocatalytic set of 1,500 small molecules in a bacterium and an archaea from two and a half billion years ago. That suggests that and that has no polymers in it, no DNA, no RNA, or no protein. Joanna's results with Bill Martin, and I'm on the paper, and of him, Hordick and Mike Steele, but it was Joanna's idea. Joanna's idea says it looks like you can have self-reproducing molecular systems with no DNA, RNA, or proteins. So we know that. And we know that the universe cooked up by 5 billion years ago a chemical diversity of around 50, 60, 70,000 kinds of molecules. They're present on the Murchison meteorite that was formed when the biosphere, when the solar system was formed 5 billion years ago, and they're on Enceladus. So the universe cooks up this chemical complexity. We're missing one step. If we can show that given a chemical diversity of 80,000 chemicals in a pot, they will rather naturally, spontaneously form a self-reproducing molecular system, then we understand life's emergence of the universe in a very different way. We don't know that yet, Shinan. I think it's very likely. The theorems say it's likely. We haven't proved it, but suppose we've proved it. Then we get- I have a question here. Go ahead. 
for example, I'm a neuroscientist and we are trying to model the activity of the brains in, a, in computers, like from very simple animals up to humans. But we have an information problem because, because the brains are very, very complex. We need to put in a lot of information to make the simulation run correctly. So there is a huge body of information in biological realm if you just look at the living things. So where is this information is coming from? What do you think? This, this information, can information be arising from uh, yes. the biosphere itself? And how can it be? Well, let's get to it. Yeah, right. I, I have realized the same thing recently, Shannon. So, but meanwhile, here we've got this autocratic set and it's self-reproducing. That is, that's molecular reproduction, it's not modern life. Mm -hmm. So one needs to get from the replication of a set of small molecules to polymers like proteins, and from there to from there to a polymerase and copying the DNA in there to coding. Mm -hmm. So one can begin to imagine that. Let's let's jump over it. Uh, at this stage, it's all hypotheses, but 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 we're here, so it must have happened. Once you've got life, and living things can and diversify and make livings with one another. Like you develop a flat surface that I can crawl on. I'm going to go back and expand this more. It became just fascinating to me. Uh, that is the generation of information. Okay, so this, let me try to, let me try to, sh this is so important. We all know Shannon's notion of information, is Shannon information. Now you have a source of the information and it's got a bunch of different messages. So you've got bit strings length n, so the two to the n possible bit strings. And the source has many copies of some and not so many copies of the other. And you transmit them down the channel and receive them. All that can happen in this case, you can transmit the information and you might lose some. You don't generate any information at all. And there's no semantics, it's all syntactic, right? And we've been stuck there since Shannon. So that's not what's happening when you develop a flat body and I can crawl on the surface to get some food. That's meaningful and it's information and, it, and it's semantic, it's not syntactic. So I, I, I'm going to get to what I got to in about a month and a half ago, Shinan, um, talking to my friend Andrea Roli. It's kind of amusing. So we were talking about robots, which he makes, and he's, he said, you know, when I make a robot, I, I cheat. I put, I put a television camera on the robot. I've already defined what's going to be relevant to it, photons. And it can't develop new sensors because I built them. Uh, and I said, yeah, it's just, where do the sensors come from? So we're struggling with that. And I got to the following. Imagine the robot is in a big aluminum body. And the robot is sweeping up the room and then it plugs itself in and gets some electricity. And the robot bumps into the wall and gets a dent. You know what a dent is? Did I tell you about this last time we talked? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we talked a little bit, yeah. Okay, so now it's got a dent. Suppose the bumps are located close to where the electric plug is. If only the poor robot could detect the bumps and use that information to get to the plug, but it can't. It, it's it can't, it's just a robot. Now make it an organism that can construct itself. Living cells construct themselves, do a constraint closure. And suppose that the beginning of a bump detector starts happening in this little organism. Well, it gets to the food a little faster. So there could be heritable variation and selection, and pretty soon bump detectors emerge. Mm -hmm. But Andrea didn't specify the bump detector. It happened. Now, then I got to the following. Suppose there's two kinds of robots or bacteria and um, some food. And one develops a bump detector and the second develops a bump. And the first develops a dent and the other one develops a dent detector. Then they can recognize each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then if they can coordinate to get food and do it better because they can coordinate, then something magic called bumps and bump detectors and dents and dent detectors will evolve in the biosphere. Well, that's, that's what happened. Cool, but, but 
what is sacred about it? What, well, let me, get, hang on. Let, let, let me go ahead before you ask me why is it sacred. What this means is, first of all, there's, a, there's an arbitrary relationship between dense and the physical degrees of freedom of position and momentum. Mm -hmm. So we can't translate from the physical degrees of freedom to what, what counts as a dent or a bump. I haven't told you what a bump is. It could be anything. It could be a smell. It could be a pattern of reflected light. It could be the corner of a room. It could be anything. Yeah. Point one. Point two, as we develop a greater number of bumps and dents and bump detectors, the number of combinations goes up combinatorially. So we've got 10 kinds of detectors. There's at least two to the 10th worlds. Mm -hmm. So our worlds are getting more complex and we're creating them with one another because by doing so, we can collaborate and get to whatever food is for us. So the world is becoming ever richer in what's around us and we are making meaning with one another. It's enormously full of meaning. Mm -hmm. There's a debate to get into here about whether or not uh, this is, uh, uh, it's, it's accidental that you stumble upon something or if we can come to uh, be dynamical systems that can recognize it, or is there a role for, or is there a role for consciousness and free will? And I think there is, and I think I'm beginning to know why. Anyway, this has generated this incredibly complex biosphere with hundreds of, you know, millions of species, and we've been creating how to live with one another, and the conditions of our existence for almost four billion years. That's something like a third of the lifetime of the universe. So we are in a world that is not the mechanical world of Newton. That world is here, but we're also in biases. And if life is easy uh, to come to existing on, and there's a uh, hundred billion galaxies, each with a hundred billion stars, most of which have so uh, solar systems, there's 10 to the 22 solar systems. And suppose life emerges on one in a million of them. Well, okay, so there's, uh, there's 10 to the 16th biosphere out there, rife with meaning. Our universe is filled with meaning all over the place. And it's not sterile, it's this unfolding becoming in which we are always the conditions of one another's current existence and what comes to be next, including in our economy. Th that isn't the world of Newton. And it isn't the world of the existentialists. I'd like to get consciousness in there, which I can't, I think I can in a moment. So ask, why is that sacred? Mm -hmm. So let's, let's try to find an answer together, okay? So, okay. so, so there was the magical God 10,000 years ago, and you propitiated that God, and the hunt was better. Then in the axial age, it became transcendence in different ways, in which it became a God of some form of salvation, whether it's Christianity and heaven and hell, or Buddhism of some kind of peace and nirvana, or whatever. Meanwhile, there's the Taoist notion of the way, which accepts an ebb and flow of life. The West is all about dominance and control. It is, it is, it is Francis Bacon, I take all knowledge to be my province, to put nature on the rack and rest our due. But what I'm telling you is, we cannot prestate the future. Who could, have, who could have prestated that the engine block would come to be used to crack open coconuts? The enlightenment is in a knowable, rational world where we can optimize. It's all an engineering problem. It's complex, it's an engineering problem. Life isn't just an engineering problem. It keeps becoming things that no one could have imagined. And so life is richer than, and this is beyond, this is beyond, this is beyond deductive rationality. The, 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 the joy of the Greek notion of human rationality, of the enlightenment rationality, it's wonderful. It's inadequate to life. Life is richer than reason. It's intuition and emotion and getting on with it. Um, so let's ask if there's a sense of the sacred beyond old, old religion, which is magic, newer religion, which is roughly salvation, and honoring that which is beyond, namely a God out there, and we will live for and in service of God, whose 
creativity is the only thing that can explain what's here, to an emerging view in which the creativity around us is stunning and natural, unprestatable, and we are of it. Not above it, we're of it. We are of nature, not above it. So I feel profoundly that if we come to sense ourselves, uh, as Marina Cortez said today, she's one of the group of us making the shape of history effort, humbly, we're humble because we are of it and we can't control it. We are part of it as we all become. So there is a flow to it and a, a natural, it, it feels something like giving up the notion of pure mastery and control and knowledge and mastery and control, putting nature on the rack to rest our due and a, a wider inclusion of a participation in the creative becoming of which we are members. And that's being in the world in a different way. Okay. Now, I, I want to call that sacred. Do we need, okay. so do we need a supernatural God? Mm -hmm. And I don't think we do. There's a, there's a belief system, you know, probably, which is called pantheism, right? It probably sure. says that everything is a part of God and the physical events are just manifestations of God. So whatever you see here is a part of God or uh, they're all God. Uh, what's the difference of your idea from this pantheistic view? Well, help me understand it. So maybe there's no difference. Mm -hmm. So do we need in this view to have a sense of the sacred, of membership, of transforming ourselves as human beings to a somewhat more mature state. Mm -hmm. Here we are in a consumer society. As Gordon Brown said, we're reduced to price tags, mm -hmm. which we understand. But when I say, Shinan, reduced from what? We know the answer, but we can't say it. We are reduced from our centers as human beings. We really don't have to spend our, our time and life making plastic things that don't matter. We could be something deeper, which is something like a human membership in the unfolding that we're all part of. Mm -hmm. Now that again feels sacred to me. Could there be in all of this some supernatural something? Sure. Uh, for example, I've written an article saying that the notion of a cosmic mind is possible. We don't know what mind is, and we don't know what consciousness is, except that we are. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe there's cosmic mind. Do I need that to already be um, enchanted by? I've, I've given talks on re-enchantment of humanity. We were disenchanted, and this is something Weber said, we were disenchanted when, basically when Newton came along and the industrial revolution, and the world became mechanical. I think this is a, a genuine re-enchantment, and it's true. It's, it's true. I mean, here I am turning 81, and I'm overweight, and I get to do science, and I can go over to, I can go over to Deer Harbor and get fantastic ice cream cones. <laughs> How much do you want? And the grasshoppers are around, and the, the raccoon comes and takes our banana peels. Isn't that wonderful? Very wonderful. But when, when I use the word sacred, Mm -hmm. I generally mean something or some notion that forced me to do some stuff and, you know, uh, prevent me to do some other stuff. Like, for example, prevents me to do some sacrilege or disrespectfulness against something sacred. Or, for example, um, make me feel awe or do some certain, you know, rituals or things or good doings, whatever. So, in your definition of sacredness that is inherited in this biosphere on the, or in the universe. So human beings are again still an agent and we should do something. We're doing stuff as you described before and we're ruining it. We're just polluting, we're you know, killing each other. What should we do? What that kind of sacredness drives us to do? What would you suggest? What is the difference? For example, I mentioned the pantheism, but it's yeah. Certain form of the pantheism uh, comes down to this, because all the things is are gods, the parts of God. So I am a part of God. So whatever I do is an act of God. It, it, there's no evil. There's no good. Whatever. If I just you know spoil the environment, that's the act of God. So I'm sorry. So it's one interpretation. So how can we uh, take some lessons 
from this uh, you know divine creativity that we see in the biosphere and some some do some good work uh, what would you suggest how how do you look at nature in that way uh, I, I don't know if I expressed it clearly because if something you know. is sacred it must direct me because by the way maybe the sacredness is actually it uh, it's, maybe it doesn't direct you maybe it invites you mm -hmm. okay we are uh, we haven't said these things before so we're exploring roughly what is a next step mm -hmm. so right now let's leave out the notion of a supernatural and mm -hmm. put it in later and also i am learning from reading this book the axial age in a wonderful chapter by charles taylor the evolution of human religion always keeps some of the older features there is still if if there was ten thousand years ago and five thousand years ago six thousand years a magic god Mm -hmm. that then became a higher religion, we still carry forward aspects of our older ways of being in the world and it's agentival and symbolic and sacred objects and so on that become part of our life, but then broadens the new ways of being spiritual, which happens with the birth and growth of Christianity. But what if there's something the new that is coming along that's on the edge of being, which is a sense of co-creative membership in a co-creative biosphere, there's there's no doubt that that's true. That's why we're here. And it, it invites, as Marina said today, a, a humility that's not control, it's participation. And what are we then invited to do? We're invited, and, and, and it's really important to try to answer this. We're invited to understand something about how we are and what we are impacts all of life. Uh, to be careful in our actions. When we do something, we don't know what we're going to unleash. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid growing up in California, we had Smokey the Bear to not have forest fires. And we thought that was wonderful. And it turns out we were allowing the understory to grow up and the fires are worse. Well, we invented plastic 60 years ago and there's plastic all over the planet and we don't need it. I mean, my way of saying it is, as I was born in, in 39, we won World War II without any plastic. <laughs> People actually went to grocery stores and they've been selling vegetables for thousands of years without having them shrink wrapped in plastic. We don't need all of this stuff. And, and, and so as we do things, we don't know what their consequences are going to be. We need to air correct a lot faster than we are. Uh, you're saying part of it, Sheenan, and, and I, let me struggle to say it. When in the United States, when uh, when when uh, Martin Luther King said at the at the mall, "I have a dream that one day," we knew what he was talking about. He was talking about an enslaved people finding membership, equality, lack of rejection in the American community. What we need now to articulate is, I have a dream, what is it? It is something like a growing membership and awareness of membership in this ongoing evolution of a totally creative biosphere of which I get to be a member tied together with the amazing capacity for human creativity, tied together with the fact you know the tap equation I told you, yes? So, so now we've gone from having tens of goods a, a couple of million years ago to a few hundred, 30,000 years, to billions of now. We can create new things so easily now. Instead of that being our destruction by going on and creating things and destroying the biosphere, is it possible to begin to think how we choose among the things that we can invent next, things to invent that are wonderful to invent and use, and don't rip the biosphere apart. And, and be careful without knowing what we unleash as we do so. We can invent things so rapidly now, Shinon, that, that if we don't harness our own creativity collectively, we will inevitably destroy the biosphere. So we are confronting a spiritual challenge, an intellectual challenge, a civilizational challenge that humanity has never confronted. No species on this planet has confronted. 
and I'm overwhelmed by it. It's taken seven, 3.7 billion years for the accumulated know-how of things making living with one another, and we're coming along and we're just destroying it. Yeah. And it, we're not even being yeah. evil. Yeah, yeah. We're, 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 yeah, we're just doing our thing. Nobody's being bad. Well, some people are, but we're not being bad. We're being creative people thinking here's the next wonderful thing to do. And we invent plastic, and that seems like a good idea. And now plastic is shrink wrapping. I go to the grocery store, the lettuce is shrink wrapped. You don't need shrink wrapped lettuce, but we're doing it. So we have to find a way that some mixture of humility and amusement and joy and creativity and anger, which is people, to be on the planet that's so meaningful among. 10 to the 16th biospheres in a meaningful universe where we co-create the conditions for one another to exist. That's true. It's not my imagination. It is, and yours, it's true. So we are, if this is true, we are in the world in a different way. And we really are. By the way, um, I'm now... Uh making some plans in my head and actually I, I'm trying to dream the consequences of a world that everyone sees the world as you do uh, and accept what you said and try to behave accordingly that world could be a paradise the, 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 no question about that but what you say right now uh, it's probably bothering the people of faith and secular humanist people, I mean, the vast majority of the world will be very annoyed by this because they had some previous stories in their mind. They have some uh, meaning references about the world. So when you, for example, when or I or you come up as a scientist and say, don't do this, uh, you, you will, you know, ruin yourself, you will um, destroy the climate or whatever, they can listen to us, they can understand us. But when, when you come up and talk about the ultimate story, the ultimate reason, uh, I meaning God and the religion and faith and sacredness, whatever, do you think this will be heard by the people? Because you need to destroy a lot of things in order to show them what's obvious. Did, did you have any experiences in that? I'm just wondering, because as, I, as we talked in Istanbul before, I am dealing with the same thing, for example. I'm trying to tell Muslims that actually the Quranic terminology is very, very uh, suitable with this latest scientific uh, worldview that I am trying to describe, because I mentioned you about the word Kevin in Arabic. It means the continuous creation, ongoing creation. It's not fixed. Now you what, what's the word? Kevin in Arabic. What, how do you say it? Kevin? E, K, E, V, and N. Kevin. Kevin. Kevin, yeah. You told, you told me that it's in the Old Testament as well. Yeah, yeah. But there's a, of, it's not that God created the world in six days. He's still creating it. It's actually a continuous creation, like you described. Uh, despite the fact everyone knows this word, everyone uh, makes translations in their own language, but they cannot experience it in the world. Because um, in human psychology, probably there's something like this. First, we believe, we construct a model, we believe something, and then we see the world accordingly. And when right. you come up with an idea to shatter their uh, beliefs, then they become blind, literally. They actually can see. Do you have any experience or possible solutions to this? Because I find your, uh, um, you know, things, I find what you said very valuable. Sinan, thank you. I think it's very valuable too, and it's irrelevant whether it's me, but right now it's me. So yes, yeah, so first of all, um, in, in, in Buddhism, there's the, there's the notion that I've heard but don't understand it's it's codependent origination that's so very codependent much like condition. origination yeah okay yeah the Buddhist notion of codependent origination sounds very much like continuous creation mm -hmm. continuous creation could be an outside agent mm -hmm. codependent uh, uh, 
codependent origination sounds like a coming together and we're all creating it together, which is very much what the biosphere is doing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the notion of codependent origination is not that hard to grasp. And as you get it, you, all you have to do is think about the evolution of, 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 a, of the economy. It's about a bunch of codependent origination of all kinds of technologies that create the conditions for one another's getting to exist, right? And yeah. you can't say it ahead of time. You can't deduce it. Uh, so we've lived it in the last 50 years, the last 100 years. We, we know it. Maybe that can be gotten across. Uh, so you, you're raising the right issues. It, it, let's suppose right now that roughly what I and we are talking about is a pathway forward, not only in the sense of through the Anthropocene to something that could be better beyond. That's what we need. Mm -hmm. We need a spiritual rebirth right now, which involves or could involve being in reality in a different way, which is maybe what we're talking about. Uh, so let's talk about where the resistance comes. Uh, so you speak to it. Let's see what we can say. So if you're a secular humanist in New York, uh, uh, you, you know, you're, you're a lawyer or a banker or a plumber, and you don't believe in God. What do you say when you hear this? I say, it's not a mechanical world. It's this. Are you appalled? Are you interested? Are you annoyed? Are you uh, willing to hear? Mm -hmm. you, you come back, and then let's try it from the point of view of a devout Muslim or a devout Catholic. Actually, what, what do you... If I hear you actually i heard your uh, words as a muslim uh and i resonated differently than other muslims that's the problem because i uh, questioned some stuff that traditional beliefs and rituals and thinking patterns and i felt some discomfort because of my interest in science when i encountered with you i found something interesting because there is a reconciliation of these doubts and uh, you know possibilities, so it's resonated differently in me. But when I discuss your ideas with very close friends of mine, uh, time to time, there could be very different reactions. There can be very different reactions. I saw them before, so this is uh, what I'm struggling because the idea is very simple and it's very obvious. But we have a very hard time to show this very basic notion to everyone. So we are not uh, perceiving the same reality because I know it's from my neuroscience studies. We are, we are seeing we are living in different worlds. Of course, our mental uh, worlds are different. But the basic story must not be uh, that complicated. I'm, I'm looking for a way to simplify it for everyone. This, this is actually the basic idea is very simple. And actually, I cannot object. No one can object that. But the previous stories are generally clashing if you say God and religion and faith. You told me once that you are an atheist. But after I talk with you in this uh, couple of years, I, I'm now seeing a man of faith. Actually, you are believing... Yeah a very, very grand idea. So uh, this is actually a discussion between faiths. It's, it's not uh, just science or philosophy anymore. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yes. So uh, it, I, don't, I don't really mind the idea of a supernatural something. I've, I told you I've written an article on it. And fine, but let's just set it aside now. Yes, I think that what I'm talking about is profoundly religious. Because it's, it, is an under, it is a way of understanding what the universe and the world is, understanding how we have come to be in it, and what meaning is. Well, that's what we've always asked. Who are we? Why are we here? What are we here for? These are, if you will, sort of new answers to our questions for... Uh, Undoubtedly, Neanderthal was asking this 500,000 years ago. We're close cousins. So we have been asking this for half a billion years. Who are we? What is, he, what is this here? Where are we? Why are we here? How do we come to be? We've always had origin myths. 
is in Kalevala. It's the woman who waters alone, uh, and the bird springs from her breasts, and the flowers come back as the ice age melts. This is another origin story. Mm -hmm. This, 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 this uh, it is another orange story, right? It's not, it's not, uh, it's not God and Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden. It's a co-creation of everything that is and ever was, and we are of it. Even maybe the universe. I'm working right now on a, a theory about the coming to be of the universe, and the universe is conceivably a Kantian whole. Mm -hmm. it's, I don't know if it's right, but it's very pretty. Mm -hmm. But anyway, this is certainly true for biasers. So, so be, tell me what your Muslim friends might respond to all of this. Does well, it, actually, they, generally it say, they generally say it sounds like pantheism. It's nothing new because uh, it actually straps you out of your responsibilities because you just give material world to ability to create. And if it creates, then if there is no divine being watches us, controlling us, you know, uh, giving directions to us, then there will be no punishment, no responsibility, so on and so forth. Because their story is actually based on a personal God, uh, you know, set all the things from the beginning and watches the universe and watches this willful beings uh, to control and, you know, punish or reward, whatever. So this is the basic story. Because of that basic story, it's not easy to tell people this very simple notion. So, she, you know, let's, let's spend time over this. As I listen, let's really do this, okay? So as I listen to you, I got struck when you said that the response is, look, I have no responsibilities then. Mm -hmm. Well, how, that doesn't follow from what I've said. What I've said is we are co-creating members of a biosphere. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I have membership in and responsibilities to all of life. Mm -hmm. you know, unless, I'm morally, unless I'm morally blind. Mm -hmm. So how does one get, so what's the step that the listener says to saying no responsibilities that is within the story that I'm saying? I don't think what I'm saying I don't think the no responsibility is part at all of what I'm saying. Yes, of course. So, mm -hmm. so where does it come from when you're coming from a religious thing? That, that if, just say it. What, what is it that means that if I were right, it would mean that there's no responsibility if you're the religious Muslim friend? Mm -hmm. Well, if there's no responsibility, it means that you can do anything you want. So this means disorder or chaos. Yeah, sure. But how, do, how does the religious Muslim get to there's no responsibility? Because there's no God to punish you or what? Yeah, of course. If there's, a, uh, if there's no superior authority out of this world uh, governing mm -hmm. everything, then uh -huh. if everything creates each other uh, interdependently, uh, and if there's all to it, if all, this is all reality that we can uh, know, then mm -hmm. there will be a problem because the master story they began to life with is not compatible with that. Because um, you mentioned that uh, most of the religious people across centuries looked for God in the gaps in their knowledge. When they don't know something, they said that this is done by God. Right now, science has narrowed down these gaps very, very tightly. So actually, there is a problem with traditional beliefs. In modern beliefs, there are some reconciliation attempts, but they're not very well because they don't know science, they don't know religion in uh, great depth. So there's always a problem with trying to reconcile them. But this idea is simple, but destructive because of it is obvious nature. That's what I'm trying to tell. If you say, if you can actually you can easily convince people scientifically that this is doing that. Actually, you're doing this in your book very well, like, you know, uh, autocatalytic networks, so on and so forth. You just tell everything. But in order to put this in a grand scale as a big story, big meaning, there's generally a problem with the religious people. Most of the people in, on this world is religious, by the way. But if a person is secular without any beliefs, a materialistically thinking person is generally having a discomfort with this because 
your ideas is also pushes them into some kind of meaning construction. They need to construct a meaning out of this meaningless world. So you have two different difficulties in two different realms. Actually, um, I am struggling with the same thing, by the way. It's, it's quite fun, not that, you know, miserable. I'm, I'm really thrilled that we're talking about this. So again, let's take our time. Um, let's still, let's, so let's switch now and take it from the modern secular humanist mm -hmm. uh, who is in a sense, you know, absolutely practical, you know, you know, the scientific facts, ma'am, and it's just the real world. And don't give me all of this moralizing crap. Uh, so, actually, the, if you can, if you can tilt your monitor because I lost your face. No. What's the response of that person, and why? Well, actually, that person is probably hear. more lucky, because um, accepting this fact. Uh, also, uh, you know, force them to accept a grander meaning that probably they don't get used to. Um, but actually, your idea advocates such people that they should live according to their uh, setup or creation or, uh, you know, uh, evolutionary requirements. If you if you know yourself better, then you will behave better because you are generated in this realm, because you, you are a product of this uh, creative biosphere, and it's probably this is more acceptable. But if there will be some moral consequences out of this, then probably there will be some conflicts. Actually, um, I never, uh, up to this point, discussed your ideas with, uh, you know, educated atheists right now, because, uh, I, I don't have the I didn't have the opportunity right now, but I generally talk with people with different kind of religious belief, and generally they feel some kind of anarchy between their stories and this very simple idea. I generally start with the world that I have a religious belief, uh, you know, in mm -hmm. me, and with that religious belief, this idea looks quite brilliant. So why don't you buy it? Probably they don't buy it because I bought it already. <laughs> Maybe it's about that. I oh, don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, of course. I mean, so, look, let, let, another piece of this that you said is, uh, if God's, roughly it's the following, God is the source of, of moral order and moral authenticity. Mm -hmm. So if God says it's right, it's right. And if God says it's wrong, it's not. So, um, so the only way that we know that something is good or bad is because God said it, and if you're a Christian, you'll get into heaven. Mm -hmm. What if we say, look, put that down. Why are we moral? Well, we're social primates, yes, and we're, and we're, 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 we're mammals, mm -hmm. and it evolved. Mm -hmm. Tyrannosaurus rex took care of its babies, mm -hmm. you know, 60 million years ago. We've had millions of years of having kids and looking after them and living with one another, hundreds of millions of years, and we have evolved ways and acquiring emotions that mediate how we live with one another. So this has evolved, and it's evolved for very good reasons. Mm -hmm. It's how we live with one another. It's part of making our worlds together. Yes, of course. That, that's, that's another co-created adaptation, and it comes with feelings, and, and the feelings are real and the emotions are real. And when you love somebody, you really love them. And when you hate them, you, you know, you really do, but don't kill them. Why isn't that a sufficient source? Why do we have to have God? Actually, for me, it's very sufficient because if you, in, in most of the religions, religious scripture is, uh, you know, uh, called as teachings, right? But actually for me, they're reminders because sure. we, we have- we already know. We have moral obligations, we have social rules, we are social uh, animals, so we need to obey some kind of rules in order to survive, okay? So these must be reminders, but if you put them as teachings, teachings are coming from a teacher, the teacher, uh, you know, teaches you that you don't know, you don't have that information and you, get, you, you have to get them from them. So this actually makes a problem, this it creates an authority, so it's like, you know, um, priests and imams and whatever 
they uh, show you the way and you should go. But in my opinion, in most of the people's opinion, actually, if you look at that way, we forget things because we are human beings. We have uh, a lot of desires. We, we cannot, you know, satisfy ourselves. And something needs to stop us because we, we are the only creature that has a potential to destroy the, destroy the whole biosphere. So it's, we are very dangerous, actually. In order right. to stop us, we need to understand what's going on we, and we need to understand our nature uh, in, a sen- in essence. So actually, wow. my latest book is all about that. I wrote uh, you know, three books in one subject. It's called The Human's Devout Settings. It's actually what I am dwelling right now. I am trying to figure out, I'm actually trying to draw a picture about humans, uh, a totally biological picture coming from the evolutionary pers- perspective. And mm-hmm. also I put some uh, modern neuroscience in it and trying to tell everyone that this is our default settings. If you live by this, you're going to be happy. And science say that, evolution says that. This ancient wisdom also points to that. And this is only a reminder because we all know that. But if you, do, you know, classify as a teaching, then there's a problem. But this is actually me talking. This is, this is my interpretation. But probably we should find a way to deliver this very basic message to all humans in an appropriate way. Probably this is our job to find this way. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Um, so I'm just echoing back. Um, trying to understand the response of a religious Muslim mm-hmm. and of a, uh, an utterly realistic New Yorker on a busy street before COVID, I can feel myself better being the... the uh, very modern New Yorker, secular humanist. Mm -hmm. And I know why it makes me angry. And it does. It's something like, look, I'm busy. You really want me to care? I don't want to care. I'm busy earning money and buying a better house. Don't bother me. I don't. That's it. I just don't bother me with the idea of caring. I don't care about rabbits. Why should I care about rabbits? Let's just kill them and eat them. I don't so want to. You, I, you, I, are, I, you are pushing them uh, from their comfort zone. Because yeah, they, you're telling, you're, yeah, you're telling me to care. And I really don't just want to bother. Leave me alone. That, that, that's, can, can you feel the response? I can feel that as, a, as an American. Yeah, yes. yeah. The same thing, actually. Because uh, if you go to a regular Muslim, uh, when you say something like that, they will understand, but they will say probably the same thing. Uh, We have a lot of things to do, a lot of things to think, a lot of things to perform. So without any, you know, significant or tempting offerings, please leave me alone. They would say something like that. And we all do, right? Yeah, yeah. We're all short-term optimizers. Yes, of course. But if I have to trade the ice cream cone that I can go get at Deer Harbor for all of this, I'll go get the ice cream cone. <laughs> That'd be ridiculous. <laughs> Probably what we are doing right now is the key. We, we are going to talk as much as we can. We are going to write as much as we can. So we spread it. Actually, I find such ideas like seeds. When they fall into, you know, right soil. They'll they, grow. You know, they grow. I keep thinking, you know, so what did, what did Jesus offer? Uh, and I'm not a Christian. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not a Christian either, but as far as I know, the, the general story for all religions, it's uh, reminding mankind what they are and offering the way of salvation. It's that simple. Live according to your... Uh, Purpose. Uh, purpose. So, in, in this story that is getting said, this is in part reminding us of who we are. We evolved primates, members of a creative biosphere. What is the? Do do we need a notion of salvation? I think there's a profound. Hang on. There's a profound notion of moral purpose in seeing ourselves as as of a biosphere. 
What's the notion? Is there a notion of salvation? There's a notion of membership that is intense. Well, I'm, 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 I'm changing my opinion right now. The people who are probably upset by this idea will not be the regular believers. Actually, the people that will, that will bother us will be the people that are having power uh, uh, over the belief, over people, uh, the, the driving people, people with faith or beliefs or religions, whatever. They don't like this idea. They will not like this idea. They actually don't like this idea. So this is the it's, very it's very democratic. Yes, yes. Democratic. I can read the Bible myself. Is the Bible stories are wonderful, uh, and there's all these other stories you know, about wildlife. Yes. Yeah, probably we solved the basic dilemma here, as far as I understand. We have a very, very simple worldview, despite we are looking from very different windows, we are seeing the same thing, and right. we can talk each other, we can yeah. understand each other. So the idea is very tempting, beautiful, understandable, not so complicated. Uh, of course, not the scientific examples that you included in here, because they need a lot of thinking, but the basic idea is very simple. So probably, if you join me on this, we can best uh, show the consequences of this to other people by living by it, being like that, you know, behaving according to this teaching, like, you know, like, uh, you know, producing science like yourself, producing art, uh, like, you know, competent artists or so on and so forth, I believe. Uh, I came to this conclusion, don't tell, don't try to convince people, just be and behave and show them that is the good way, probably. And probably the, all the prophets did the same thing, more or less. <laughs> they, they don't tell too much, they just behaved and changed the world, probably. What do you say? Well, there's a lot here. I would like to do it with you. Um, I, I think what I would like to understand, and maybe we can do it. I would really like to do it, Chidon. And we're a very, very good pair to try to do it. I mean, I'm a Jew and you're a Muslim. And you know neuroscience and I don't. Let's try doing this. Let's talk every week or two. Let's try to articulate what it would mean to say, I have a dream. Mm -hmm. Then try to articulate why that dream can be, it is naturally attractive. Um, so that, that so you see, if, if I, I know what I want to say, if all we are, if all we do is confront one another with the fact that we're destroying the biosphere, and we have, as you said this an hour and a half ago, and we have to give up our fast cars, well, who wants that? But if we can convert it into something like we're destroying the biospheres of which we're members, and we can envision being on a planet in which we have enough welfare so that we can lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and have enough uh, and get on with an incredibly creative life that's more full of meaning than what we're living now and less full of false meaning, like buying stuff that we don't need on shopping sprees, uh, so that we are closer to the center of our humanity and we, we sort of begin to understand it. All, you know, it has to be billions of us and it has to be within two decades. Otherwise, we're going to destroy the biosphere. Yeah. So the time is now, not, not three years from now. Yes, you're right. So we should do this more often. By the way, it's but, almost two hours. I'm sorry about that. I just lost track of time but, because I'm talking with you. Uh, no, right. I was planning one or one and a half, but uh, we just passed that time. Sorry about that for, from everyone. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Uh, but Look, probably, you know, th this is a good conversation. Uh, we, we cannot find it every day in every corner. So I uh, thank you very much for having this time. Thank, thank you, Dushina. So let's just set up something a week or 10 days from now and carry on. Yes, of course. We, we're going to continue this. Uh, and so I'm going to listen to you more and more. And this is a very big joy for me. Thank you very much. Well, both ways. Uh, look, you'll get this online at some point. I think you sent me the link to the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, could you send it again and you'll get this online? Of course. 
that I will send the first one and after publication this one and we're going to make a series probably uh, on these and this will well, be let's awesome. explore. and then we maybe make other groups or overlapping groups do you know what the response to the first one was actually people liked it very much they uh, wanted to uh, you know uh, they said we want uh, the continuation of this we want more so this is why we do this second meeting thanks for coming and probably they want more and more after this because uh, our followers love such uh, you know conversations love such subjects and it will be very fruitful if you ask me because people love to think such uh, issues nowadays because we are all constricted by this COVID-19. So we better. Shinan, can't you write articles about this and publish them? Actually, I'm all, always publishing such stuff, even my books and my website, but in Turkish. Uh, but maybe we can make a paper in English with you uh, after our talks. Maybe. A, uh, yes, I'm, it's more important. Sure. It's more important that this be in Turkish. So mm -hmm. I've got this sense that if things suppose that what we're talking about begins to grow in turkey well you're in a, such an interesting center of the world you know you're not big amazing america leaving out erdogan right now uh you're still sort of a democracy and you are you are where things could spread from where you are to uh you know the the the, the stands and to Greece and to it could spread out from a very funny spot on on, on a periphery. Things can start in a periphery and grow yes, in ways that can't in in huge centers like the United States. Yes, this is actually why we are working so hard twenty four seven because these areas are very important areas historically, and we have a duty. We need no. to fulfill our job. Hopefully, before we die. You're continuing to work. You know, we've been coming through your part of the woods for 30 or 40,000 years, right? And yeah. We all had to get across the Bosphorus. Yeah. I, I will never forget the restaurant with that gorgeous view. We are, we are waiting, both of you, again. We'll come back. As soon Sit as on one. So let's do it again in a week or 10 days. And it's just a delight. Of course. Tell my best. We love you. See you again. Love you. It's just a delight. Bye. Bye-bye.